who are advancing to the rank of professor with an opportunity to present an overview of their scholarly activity, their research interest and contributions that they are making to the domain of knowledge. And in so doing, we can celebrate. They can promote their uh, scholarship and we can celebrate with them this academic reputation. And secondly, it provides us as the academic community with an opportunity to learn about the scholarly activity and the research endeavors and achievements of our leading faculty, thereby promoting the IS academic culture. This afternoon, before we start the program and go into the uh, introduction of the professor, the lecture itself, the response, let us stand for the opening prayer. Shall we stand? Our Father in heaven, thank you for this opportunity to meet and to listen to the scholarship, the exploration of one of our prominent faculty members here at IAS. Lord, we want your blessing to rest on Dr. Dumitrescu. He is a faithful steward of yours. He has dedicate, dedicated his life, his talents, his time to working for you and doing his best for you in terms of his academic life. And we pray for, his for your blessing on his endeavors. Thank you for bringing us here, and thank you for bringing Dr. Dumitrescu here to IS. We pray that his work as a professor will help him to impact not just our community here at IS, but impact the entire Adventist world and impact the entire world, not just the academic world. We pray all of this because we know that you love to work in and through each of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Please sit down. Good afternoon. I would like to introduce to you uh, Dr. Christian Dumitrescu from the point of view of his life as a uh, student and also today as one of our respected you know, theologians here in the field of mission. He um, completed his Bachelor of Theology in the Romanian Adventist Theological Institute in 1991. In 1996, he completed an MAR in religion in Newell College in the United Kingdom. In 1997, he got a license in theology for Bades Baliai University in Cluj, Napoca, Romania. And uh, in 2010, he got his PhD in religion from Andrews University in Berrien Springs, Michigan. Regarding his pastoral experience, from 2013 to the present, he has been pastoring one of the congregations in Tagaytay City Central SDA Church, belonging to the Central Luzon Conference here in the Philippines. And uh, from 1991 to 1994, he was pastor in Oltenia Conference in Romania. His academic work experience is also very uh, broad because he was dean of library and lecturer at Romanian Adventist Theological Institute from 1996 to 1998. From 1999 to 2003, he was a graduate assistant at Andrews University 
And from 2002 to 2012, he worked as an adjunct and contract faculty at Andrews University. From 2003 to the present, he has been associate editor for the Journal of Adventist Mission Studies. From 2012 to 2015, he was PhD MTH program director here at IAS. And from 2015 to 2017, he was a DMIS and program director here at IAS. I would like to say that uh, from 2012 to the present, he has been very much engaged with research, teaching, and also conferences, uh, guiding also, giving his opinion and uh, points of view in different committees in his area of missiology here in this division and also in NSD. I have to say that uh, he has been teaching classes on theology and history of mission, strategy of mission, anthropology for mission, and a number of classes that you can see in your brochures. And I have to say that now he is fully uh, dedicated to do research, to teach, and to continue you know, strengthening our institution in the field of missions. I would like to take the time now for him to make his presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind words. But what you have heard refers to the past. The theme that I'm going to present this afternoon looks into the future. Because research is not only done to find what others have found in the past, but it is to discover what God has already prepared for the future, especially in the area of mission. I would like to talk this afternoon about the reality and the apparent and to specifically look at worldviews and missiological strategies. My presentation will combine research, uh, one of which was um, done a few months ago in New Caledonia in the Kanak tribes. But before I proceed with my presentation, I would like to introduce you to the, what I'm going to, to present. And that will be to describe a little bit the worldview, then to look at the biblical view, and then move to a case study. Since you do not have the paper for the presentation, I try to include most of the major points in the PowerPoint slides so you can follow along. I will not read the presentation, but I will try to speak freely about the topics that are dear to my heart. We hear the world worldview more and more today. But what is a worldview? When we meet people and we recognize that they have a worldview, we ask the question, what it is? Can you define it? Using some definitions of, the, of other scholars, we conclude that worldview is a, an abstract concept. It is not a reality. No one can touch it. Nobody has seen a worldview, although all of us have one. Where is our worldview? In Charles Kraut's words, this is the central control box of our lives. A worldview presents us with questions and answers. And those questions are the fundamental questions we have to face in life, such as who are we? Who are the others? How should we relate to each other? What causes things to happen in the world, in life? 
what is time, how should we relate to it, and finally, what is space, and how we should live in and interpret it, live in it and interpret it. Our worldview is the one that informs us what is real, what is really real. There are many other things that may uh, confront us, we may see them, but we don't know exactly where to place them. So our worldview is the one to make sense of the reality out there. Logic is informed by our worldview. Our feelings are also, and the emotional reactions are informed by our worldview. So the scripture is not stra a stranger when it comes to worldview. Because every writer in the scripture had a particular worldview. And when we read their books, we have to go back and try to understand what was their worldview and why they wrote what they wrote. In mission, worldview becomes one of the most important concepts. Is it real? Are we dealing with a reality? Or is it only something that we imagine and we try to guess and interpret? Remember that a worldview is made up of assumptions. And assumptions are assumptions. They are not proven facts. Assumptions are not checked. They are simply assumed. How can we check our assumptions and how can we verify if they are true or not? This is the most difficult process, to check the assumptions and see if they really inform us about what is real, what is true. Unfortunately, what we see is what we, what we call the apparent, the visible. And everything that's visible needs to be interpreted. Everything that's visible carries a meaning, has a, an associate meaning. That's why too often the apparent is not the real. And we have to discover that what it seemed to us to be a certain way we have to discover it's totally different. But because we have our own worldview and our own assumptions and that we are not aware of them, these are assumptions, we have to discover them first. How can you discover assumptions? Again, scholars decided that in order to discover our own assumptions or somebody else's assumptions, we have to retort to a metacultural greed, or what Charles Van Engen calls a cultural and spiritual interface. Since I teach in the area of mission and I do research in this area, I would like to restrict the discussion to the field of mission. Worldview is a concept in philosophy too, but I I will try this afternoon to stay away from the philosophical field so I can address what I have in mind. Our own assumptions do not become visible until we meet a different culture with a different worldview. Only then, when we see that people do things differently, interpret things differently, we realize how we interpret in our own worldview. And we, we want to discover our assumptions because we do not want to go to war with the wrong bullets. That means we already lost the war. The best way to discover our own assumptions is when we go through a crisis moment. A crisis forces us to face ourselves and to try to explain to us why we reacted this way, why we thought that way, and why we acted in a certain direction. Sometimes we realize that in a new context there is impossible to operate, to live 
based on our previous assumptions. So we are forced to check and sometimes to alter our own assumptions. I can illustrate this. When we arrived here in the Philippines, we realized that it's a different culture and we started to learn what the assumptions of the local people here are. At IAS, we live in a community with up to 80 countries or 80 cultures represented here. And in our, during our interaction, we realize there are differences and we have to discover what causes those differences. When you go to the scripture and we try to read it, we discover that we read it with our own assumptions. There is no equivalent, culture equivalent, in the new culture for the way we are used to interpret the scripture. For example, on the island of Papua, there are no sheep, no lambs. So when you go as a missionary or as an evangelist, as a pastor, and talk about the Lamb of God, what do people have as a mental picture in their mind? Nothing. Because that reality does not exist there, and they don't know how to interpret it. However, some missionaries thought that because the pig is the most popular animal in Papua, they started to talk about the pig of God. But soon we had to realize that the pig does not have the same characteristics like a lamb. A pig cannot represent Jesus Christ. So that attempt to assume that the locals will understand Christ through what they are used to failed utterly. Simply replacing a symbol with another symbol without checking if the meaning that we intend to attach to it is carried over in the minds of the local people. That transition, that attempt to communicate will lead to distortions. So I have to conclude that textual exegesis of the scripture is not enough. What we need is what we, we call the cultural exegesis. And we have to discover two cultures in order to be able to bridge between them. Not ours, primarily, but the culture of the biblical writers. Once we understand better the biblical writers, we need to discover the culture of the local people or our target people, people we are trying to reach. And then we will see if there are ways to bridge between the two cultures. Do not assume that your reading of the Bible is the real interpretation that needs to take place. Too often we failed in our reading and interpretation. Just to give you a couple of examples, Jesus is meeting the Samaritan woman. And during the discussion, he refers to the fact that she had five husbands. And in the Western view, people concluded, scholars concluded, that it's about a prostitute who had so many men in her life before. And if you read, most of the commentaries refer to this situation. However, in the Mediterranean culture, that lady was not a prostitute. That lady was a, a wife that was abandoned serially by five husbands. And most probably, the reason that she was abandoned by so many husbands was because she was barren, no children. And in the biblical culture of the time, it was normal when a woman could not produce children to be divorced and the husband would take another wife. So Jesus is not talking to a prostitute, but Jesus is talking to a decent woman who unfortunately was barren. However, the outcome of the story 
is that Jesus brings her healing. We are not reading about children, but we are reading about discovering the everlasting water and life. Western missionaries unfortunately work with what we call a modular view of a human being. And if you read theological books, you will discover allusions to Paul referring to soul, body, spirit. The Greek philosophy influenced Christianity in such a way that we look at God, we look at human beings, and try to separate them, to separate the parts, to make them removable, replaceable. So that's why missionaries today think that they can remove the traditional religion of the people and simply replace it with Christianity. Unfortunately, in practice, it doesn't work. Because when you try to remove religious assumptions from a Muslim, you realize you remove his identity. A Muslim does not have a religion. A Muslim has a Muslim identity. He is not adding a religion. When he becomes a Christian, most often he changes his identity. In Buddhism, it's the same way. When you offer Christianity to Buddhists, they ask the question, and what shall I do now? Because I am a Buddhist. This is my identity. All my family is Buddhist. And my identity is related to my family. It's not easy to just replace or remove Christianity and replace it with something else. Remember that faith and beliefs are deep-seated convictions and assumptions. And people do not change their assumptions so easily. So my first conclusion is that unless Christianity is not understood and presented as an integrated way of life, integrated way of life, strategies to reach non-Christians will have a limited impact only. Wherever you go in the rest of the world, except the Western world, people will tell you that Islam, Buddhist, Buddhism, animism, Hinduism, are ways of life. A person needs to completely change a way of life in order to become a Christian. Let me compare a little bit two worldviews, and that's the Western worldview and the Eastern or the rest of the world sometimes, as I call it. In the West, people share what we call scientific assumptions. For example, the law of cause and effect, or the fact that everything that we see around us has a known, visible, palpable, touchable cause. When you become sick, you go to the doctor, and the doctor usually tell you you have a virus, or you were infected by a bacteria. It's something that they can discover. We talk about energy. Energy comes, the scientific world we informed us, from the interaction of atom particles, molecules. But if you go to the rest of the world, you will see that although they are looking at the same issues, they have different explanations for them. In the rest of the world, people are more interested to find out what it is behind magic or spells. Or what gives power to a totem or to an amulet? Or how can I please the spirits and the ancestors because they believe they have power? And finally, people look for astrological signs to give them a hint of the future. Same reality, however, different assumptions. Let's look at space. In the West, we measure space quantitatively. And we assign space to individuals or entities. It's private space. If you go to the West, especially in the cities, also in the rural areas, every piece of land belongs to somebody. Very rarely, 
extremely rarely there is a piece of land that's land for everybody. But if you go to the rest of the world, space is measured qualitatively. Very often when I asked people from the East, how big is your house? They could not tell me because they did not measure it. They said, it's big enough for our family. Qualitative approach. It belongs to a group or a community. Not only living people are inside, but most of the time ancestors belong to the same piece of land or house and spirits freely roam around. Space is known in the East by the role it plays. For example, there is sacred space, like temples, like shrines, and there is also communal space. Here in the Philippines, we don't talk about that family's house. Most of the time we talk about the barangay, the barangay chief or captain, and the rest of the people living in that barangay. A barangay is a community space. And if we talk about a city, even we are talking about Manila, it is made out of barangays. So everything relates to the concept of the group that lives in a certain space. And the interesting thing is that nobody owns the land or the space in, in the Eastern tradition. They use it and they pass it on to the next generation. The land belongs to the ancestors, to the living, and to the unborn. Let's check the supernatural. For Westerners, if God exists, and that is a question mark in their mind, in heaven, then heaven is somewhere very far. There is no bridge between the supernatural world and the natural world. And here we can list atheists or deists or agnostics for whom divinity is not useful, it's irrelevant. The world is in motion, like the deists say, so there is no need for the supernatural to intervene. But the rest of the world is so much interested in the supernatural because they think that heaven is on earth. The door to heaven is on earth. That's why they think that divinities, although we don't see them, angels, spirits, demons, ancestors, even the unborn, they are with us. They have direct access to the natural world. I had the chance in my ministry to pastor a gypsy church, actually more than one. And I noticed that in the gypsy village, several houses had a, a bucket of water, a pail of water by the side of the door. And I asked, what, why do you keep it there? And they said, well, we want to make sure that the spirits, when they are thirsty, they can drink. And then they will not become angry against us and hurt us. In India, the same story, the same picture. That's why the Chinese take food to the columbarum or the cemetery. And they honor their ancestors with the best food that they have and they can provide. Recently, I had to deal with a situation in Indonesia, in Tana Toraja. This is a very uh, spine-chilling story because people there not only feed the dead, but they keep the dead in the house for years. Because most of the time when the dead person dies, when the, the sick person dies, they do not have enough money to provide an honorable burial or funeral to the person. So they keep the body, they uh, take care of it, they feed the body, they dress the body, and you can see in the picture, sometimes they even bring the body to public meetings because they believe that the spirit, the soul of the person is still there with them. And Finally, after several years, when they have enough money, there is a, a very fastuous ceremony, burial ceremony, and the dead person is brought to the place where all the other ancestors live. Well, what about Westerners? 
we think that uh, once we buried our dead, they are dead. And as Adventists, we have a problem with this. Because in many countries where Adventists have cemeteries, cemeteries are not well kept. Because we believe that the dead are dead. There is nothing more. There is no life after death, right? And people judge us because we don't show proper respect to our ancestors. Just think about this, about the impact it has on our mission in different parts of the world. Time. In the West, linear, non-repeatable, but time for us means money. And we even have a saying, efficiency, results. Everything is measured quantitatively. You are asked, have you done your quota? Have you finished it? And this happens also with pastors. Because pastors receive a number of people to baptize and they have a goal, a task. By the end of the year, they have to report a number of Baptists. In that time, you have a certain job to finish. But in the East, people live life differently with different assumptions. Qualitatively, they relate time to events. There is spring, there is a festival, there is summer, there is another festival. Each season is recognized by a festival. If you come from or you happen to travel to Spanish-speaking countries, you will see that they have so often fiestas, even here in the Philippines. They were influenced by the, by the, um, the Spanish. Fiestas are markers in time. They don't tell you the month of the year. They tell you what fiesta, what holiday comes next. And obviously, every year, fiestas take place again and again. So it's a repeatable type of time in different forms, sometimes like a pendulum, sometimes like a circle or a spiral. What matters for people is if during that time relationships have been established, enhanced, or something important happened in that relationship. That's why in India, for example, it's very difficult to work with people, with Hindus, whose mentality is, if I have not finished the job today, so what? Tomorrow, there is another day. I'll finish maybe tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow. And as a Westerner, you get frustrated. When are they going to finish it? Only to find out that for them it's more important to have a job and have something to do every day. For them, to finish the job is not a problem. It's more important for them to have a status, to receive honor, and to, in time, deal with relationships. What about worship? Worship time. As Westerners, we want worship to begin and to end on time. In Adventist theology, we even emphasize so much the time of the end. It's our view of time. And we even put God on our schedule. God has promised. And don't be surprised that more and more people today are trying to schedule the second coming because they want to make sure God is, comes on time. But just look at Easterners. If there is no time, enough time, to develop a relationship with God and with each other, worship is not worship. I've seen African communities begin to worship even before the time is announced. If they arrive there, they begin singing, they begin clapping, they begin sometimes dancing. And after a few hours of doing that, they move on to preaching. But preaching takes a different form, and it's long. And for us as Westerners, we check our watch and say, when is it going to end? 
only to see them, after several hours, filing out of the church, still dancing, still going through the village, shaking hands with everyone, establishing relationships, greeting people. Because for them, time is very flexible, expanding. For them, it's more important to spend that time in a relationship. And when they finally get home, sometimes at sunset, they are very satisfied because a lot of relationships were established and experienced during that day. One of my uh, colleagues got so frustrated once that for an hour and a half they simply introduced special guests. So I had to tell him, yes, because for them it's more important who is there, who honors them in their meeting, in their worship. And they're also looking to make sure that God is there and honors them in their worship. Relationship is a different way to look at time. Let me put it like this. A God that strictly requires only one hour for worship is a foreign God to the rest of the world. We need to evaluate things around us. So in the West, one of our highest values is truth and justice. In, as a consequence, we deal with laws, rules, regulations. We are busy making sure that everything is in place to assure a smooth transition for things. When someone does not tell the truth, we tell people, you are liars. And we try to discuss discourage as much as possible gossip because gossip does not have a positive view in the Western world. But when you move to the East, you realize that for them, truth and justice are not so important. I'm not saying they are not important, but not so important. More important are honor, status, and faith. And everything else in life relates to these issues. For example, someone told me a lie, an obvious lie, straight to my face. Everybody else around could hear it. And I was almost at the point of reacting, only to realize that for that person, saving face was more important than telling the truth. Everybody around, I, re I found out later, knew that that was not true. But nobody reacted, because everybody knows this is a mechanism of saving face. Sometimes, as foreigners, we are told what people think that we like to hear, although it's not true. And this impacts missiological strategies. I visited India, and we spent one Sabbath in one church. And we saw a lively congregation and a very nice church and uh, everything there was on fire, singing, preaching. Next Sabbath, however, in a church 200 and something kilometers far from the previous one, we started in the Sabbath to notice familiar faces. And then we realized that some of the ornaments in the church looked similar, if not identical, to the last Sabbath. And then we tried to find out what was going on, only to discover that they moved all the people from the previous church, all the chairs from the previous church, and all the decorations. So we would be convinced that Adventism there is alive and well. We also discovered later on that people who were there in the first congregation were not Adventists. They were Pentecostals. That's why the church was on fire. <laughs> when we confronted our, our hosts, they felt very embarrassed. And we asked, why did you do that? They told us, because we know that you are looking and you want to see Adventists growing and being alive. We understood. Face is more important and honor is more important than truth or reality. The question that we have as Westerners 
when we go to the Bible, is we see something similar there, and we don't know how to interpret it. For example, we read Exodus chapter 1, where two midwives save lives of the Jewish babies by telling Pharaoh a lie. Everybody knows it's a lie. It's not true. And we immediately read that God blessed the two ladies. So a Westerner immediately says, how can God bless two liars? They are breaking the commandment. Hold on. Let's move to the story of Jesus. We find him being asked if he's going to spend the Passover in Jerusalem. And his answer is no. Only to read a few chapters later that he goes to Jerusalem, to the temple, and teaches in the temple during Passover. Did Jesus tell a lie? To us, Westerners, yes. But to the rest of the world, oh no. No, Jesus protected his ministry. Jesus saved his face. It was normal. Maybe as Westerners we have to go back and reassess our interpretation of the scripture through our own assumptions and try to rediscover what the writers when really wanted to communicate and to, to tell us. Gossip in the East is something normal. It is a mechanism of social control. If anyone gets out of line from the group, from the community, gossip is used to bring him or her back there. Let's look at Matthew 18 and the concept of reconciliation. In the West, we read Matthew 18 as confrontative. You have to confront the person, bring another witness, confront him again, and finally put him in, the, in, in front of the church and blast him or her. No, not so. When the rest of the world reads Matthew 18, they see their mercy. They see their phases. First, you talk to the person. But then you bring another person who plays the role of the mediator. And if there is no response, even with a mediator, if that fails, you bring the community. The community, the local community. And if he does not respond to the local community, then he will have to be shamed. I found it with my gypsy friends. They did not allow their own to go to the, the government, to the courts, before they went through a, an honor court locally. And if the problem was solved locally, then we, there was no need for the, the other court later on. To the rest of the world, to show mercy is more important than judgment. To save face, to restore honor. To us, as Westerners, it may seem complicated. But if we look at the values, the assumptions, and the worldviews of people living in the rest of the world, we may understand. Let me move to strategies, missiological strategies, and the way they are impacted by our assumptions. Colonial mission. Traditionally, missionaries imposed their forms and their meanings and their assumptions and that ended up in syncretism because people did not share the same assumptions with them. Any time missionaries were not around, people went back to their practices, beliefs, to the animistic world most of the time. So real conversion does not take place unless a new set of values and allegiances and assumptions that are part of the worldview are aligned with the biblical values. We are looking for discipleship and Christian growth and maturity, but that takes place only when the deep-seated assumptions are touched. We cannot claim faith and loyalty to Jesus unless our worldview is changed. However, naturally, by default, the worldview opposes change. Because our worldview tells us one way to interpret reality and it gives us an integrated view of the world. Everything that comes new may upset this integration. 
So we have to make sure that the worldview of people has enough time to be exposed to the new information or the new experiences in order to be, uh, for a person to be converted. I would like to emphasize one thing. This is my conviction o over the years of experience. The only one who's able to convince and convict and change hearts is the Holy Spirit. Not missionaries, not evangelists, not church leaders, not even local members. The only one who changes hearts and assumptions and worldviews is the Holy Spirit. So if we try to build strategies to change people, we are on the wrong track. Because this is not our job. However, what we can do is to prepare the way for the Holy Spirit to act and people to become open to the Holy Spirit. We are looking for bridges. The best bridge is the missionary's life. Come and see. This is the best m evangelistic method. Yes, doctrines are necessary and people will learn about them, but an integrated way of life is the answer to their way of life. We are not claiming a perfect worldview, but remember the young rich ruler? He came and he said, what else shall I do in order to be saved? In other words, he claimed, I've done it, everything. And Jesus told him, yes, you've done it, but not completely. You still need to finalize this. And once you finalize it, you will find out the way to the kingdom of God. Why should we do research? Why do we waste time with research? For a simple reason. Because meaning is not visible. Meaning is hidden. And if we want to discover the meaning behind things or underneath, we really need to do research. Listen to the stories or the songs people sing ask questions, interview people, and also compare with our observations. Check with the locals, because they are the only ones who can tell you what the real meaning of an action or a certain belief is. I would like to emphasize the word integration, integration and way of life. Unfortunately, in the past, We've been guilty of emphasizing doctrines and fundamentals and theory in the detriment of experience, experiencing a way of life. Non-Western cultures share a communal character. In the West, the individual is sovereign. But communities need to be approached in a different way. I experienced situations where we went and uh, tried to offer services, medical services, to tribes or to communities, and everybody stayed away. Unless we talked to the chief and got permission, no one wanted to come to benefit from the services. That means a communal worldview. When the gate to the community is used, the community most probably will open up. And I see in the scripture that the Holy Spirit is not working only with individuals, but he is working with communities too. You look at the experience of the Pentecost, what do we see there? Thousands of people. In the West, we think that those were individuals, but if you research the local culture, those were families, clans and groups with individuals, obviously part of it. I was amazed well, that Paul, when he remembered whom has he baptized before, he remembered households. You know what a household is made of? Not only the father, the mother, or the children, but also the servants, the foreigners inside. Everybody is part of the household. My conclusion is that we need to discover not only the communal assumptions, but to get used to the concept of mass conversions. This is a totally different mechanism. It requires a different strategy. 
but without learning how to think like, like that and uh, build strategies, we will not be very successful in the rest of the world. There are two major factors that facilitate change. One is desire, the second is crisis. So one is through growth, the other one is through radical shift. When people become interested in something, attracted, curiosity will help, us to o help them to open up. But there are too many instances today where change happens radically, a shift. Immigration, wars, natural disasters. Are we ready to deal with people who go through this kind of crisis and are much more open to new concepts and new realities and new assumptions to accept the biblical worldview. Remember that when we help people physically, we also need to nurture them spiritually. And this is the case study. I had a chance to visit New Caledonia and uh, do some research there with one of our students. And we spent some time in the Kanak tribes. The Kanak tribes are the indigenous people there. They are actually almost 350 tribes. They speak more than 30 languages. And although they are different and there are differences, they share some of the values. I will describe the la coutume and la parole, the two major elements in this approach. A short history. They were colonized by the French. They were dispossessed by the land. They revolted in 1878, and that's a major historical landmark for them because their leader was decapitated, and the French took his head away. For the local people, that was the greatest shame. They could not bury properly the body without the head. Not only that, but the French made it in through into a penal colony by sending uh, convicts from Paris. After 130 years, under international pressure, the French authorities discovered the skull of the leader, Atai, and they returned it to the, to the island. It was a big ceremony. And you see in the lower picture there, the one receiving the coffin with the, the skull is an Adventist because he is the big chief on that island among the Kanak. This is a very interesting story. I don't have time to, to tell it to you completely. However, the French authorities, and New Caledonia is a French territory, denied a proper burial for the skull of Atai. And up to this day, they keep the coffin exactly in the same place. I have s visited, I have seen it, and they're still waiting for the French to make reparation, moral reparation, and to restore their honor, allowing them to bury their leader there. Looking at worldview, when the colonizers arrived there, they unfortunately used Christianity for political and colonial purposes. They treated uh, the Kanaks like uh, pagans, heathens. They even gave them pieces of, uh, of uh, glass, colored pieces of glass in exchange for land. So it was a mockery. Uh, and you know, colonists did that too many times. However, this la coutume, this is a tradition, has a principle, an innate principle, and that is exchange. When someone offers you something you have to to give back and the Canucks felt compelled to give back a gift to the colonizers and the colonizers took advantage of it keep that in mind because it's very interesting and important for what follows next missionaries came there and beside imposing the religious tradition they also imposed their worldviews and they, they thought you need to be educated you need to be civilized. And that was for more than a hundred years the activity of Christian missionaries on the island. What I saw there was that most Christians, although they are nominal Christians, 
they still share the animistic values and traditions and practices and festivals and they are not Christians. What we see is not what is real. Two major things in the Kanak worldview. The one, the first one is La Parole or the world is a, a moment when the elders tell the history to the new generations. And then the new generations have the duty to pass it on. That's the word and it's very important because it tells them exactly who they are, where they are, why they are there, what to expect in the future. Remember these questions as part of the world view. So the world, la parole, is what informs their worldview since they are children all the way to the grave. La coutume is actually a set of rules and regulations or traditions that give flesh to the la parole. How to live, how to react, how to interpret reality, everything is provided in the la coutume. And I realized being there that without understanding the meanings and the functions from the la coutume, we will not be able to truly reach the people among the Canucks. Even political authorities are paying attention these days to La Coutume and allowed the local people to have their customary civil courts, something like honor courts. So people can restore their honor and not have to end up in the, in the legal courts. A customary court, we witnessed that brings the perpetrator in front of the whole tribe and sometimes two or three tribes together if there is intertribal conflict. Yes, there is an evaluation, there is a judgment, people talk, all the parties involved, and finally there is an announcement about the, the consequence. If there is punishment, punishment is not negative in their view, but punishment allows the, the culprit or the perpetrator to be reintegrated into the community. For them, punishment washes away the shame, not only of the individual, but also of the entire community. What was very interesting when we witnessed it was that a lot of young people from the community offered themselves to get some of the lashes for the person who was guilty and dishonorable. And in this way, they became redeemers and substitutes for him. Finally, reconciliation was achieved and the restoration of relationships. When I saw that, immediately my mind went to the scripture. And I will tell you very soon what I learned about it. But right there where the judgment took place was what they call the big hut. The big hut is the place where people believe the heaven and earth meet together. Because that's where the spirits through a back window or hole can come in the hut. So the leaders of the community enter the hut. Nobody else is allowed there. It's a sacred place. And they are discussing and waiting for the spirits to communicate to them what they need to do, what the decision should be in that particular situation. The grand chief, the big chief, as I said, the one that we stayed with was an Adventist. And we questioned him, how can you deal with the belief in the spirits and still be an Adventist? And we listened to a long story, a story that saved his face but we did not get the answer that we were looking for. Because we realized that even among Adventists, worldview and deep assumptions do not easily change. Um, on their flag, there is a symbol, and the symbol illustrates how the lower invisible world, the unborn, the visible, that's, mean that's the living, and the upper invisible, the world of the spirits, the deified ancestors meet together. And that symbol is actually on top of the big hut, and uh, you can even buy as a souvenir. It, it illustrates very well how the three worlds come together in one, one place. 
few values of the Kanak, as I mentioned, relationship and belongingness. Lineage is very important because it provides identity. A person is who or she, he or she is, not because of personal achievements, but to, because of the lineage of the family to which he or she belongs. Collectivity, I mentioned already, but consensus is the goal of collectivity. Humility is another value, and uh, all around the big hut there are symbols that teach you humility. For example, in the front of the, uh, the front of the big hut, there is a 45 degree pole. And we asked the big chief, what does that mean? And he told us, well, this is a visible instruction that whenever you come here, you have to be humble. You have to humble yourself. We looked at the big hut and uh, the door is, was probably one meter tall. And we said, why is the door so small? And he said, because every time you enter in communication with heaven, you have to be humble and humble yourself. Everything there carried a meaning, a symbol. And we were looking for the symbols that they shared. When the big chief announces the decision, everybody follows consensus. And finally, everything that takes place there leads to reconciliation. So I go to the scripture and I see that the whole scripture supports the same idea. God is in the business of reconciling us with him. We turned our back to him. So God is on his mission to bring us back to his home. In the process of reconciliation, he takes our, our place, becomes our substitute, and he earns the right to offer us pardon. By bearing our shame, he also removes shame. If we manage to present to the Canucks sin in terms of shame, they will understand it because it's one of their highest values. They know what meaning purity, uh, losing purity or losing face or losing innocence is and they will avoid at any cost to get into a situation like that. They know that they are shameful and they are looking to a solution to have their honor restored. Let me propose to you, in closing, a contextualized way to present Jesus to the Canucks in light of the meanings and the assumptions discovered in their culture. We need to present to them Jesus as the word because they know what la parole is. It is that or that person who informs their worldview. But this parole comes to teach them how they should live. They have la coutume. He is not only the word, but he is the great ancestor and they know they read about the Ancient of Days and they understand that he is the God of all other ancestors. They read about the sanctuary and they can learn because they have the big hut, the grand, grand hut, and the meanings are there for them to understand the communication with the divine. And finally, the name of the one who comes to them is Emmanuel. The one who is not somewhere far removed, but shares in their worldview because he wants to stay with them. God with us. If we as missionaries would present the Kanak, Jesus, and his salvation in the terms and based on their assumptions, they are ready and uh, they will accept it because it's part of their worldview. In conclusion, Worldview change requires the work of the Holy Spirit. Discovering assumptions and worldviews simply equip us to be able to prepare the way for the Holy Spirit. Second, unless the Holy Spirit touches the deepest part of our worldview, the deepest values and unspoken assumptions, real conversation and transformation is not yet complete. Adventist mission strategies 
need to be reevaluated to make sure we emphasize the Holy Spirit and the role in conversion. And yes, we will have to teach fundamentals and doctrines, but discipleship means a totally new way of life, an integrated way of life that they will have to acquire. Cultural bridges are important because they will become tools in our hands to make message, the message relevant. And finally, understanding people's worldviews will reduce the gap between the apparent and the real. Thank you. Well, Christian, we are here this afternoon to celebrate, as Dr. Dolph said, with your family, with your colleagues and friends, this important personal milestone in, in your life. Thank you very much for this tremendous lecture. Research does matter. Clear reflections on what is going on now. Questions on how we can change things. Ca uh, can we make things better? Not only theoretically, but practically. It's indeed a privilege to me to respond to this fantastic lecture, which represents part of the breach and quality of the research being conducted here at IAS. Christian, you have invited us for a quest for a deeper understanding of this extremely powerful concept. What is apparent may not be real. You have affirmed that understanding people's worldviews may reduce the gap between the apparent and reality. Conversion should touch the deepest level of worldview, our unspoken assumptions. However, how does this happen in practice? You know, this is a very difficult lecture. Conceptualizing worldview is a challenging task as we can be easily mistaken by appearances and forms. How can you talk with authority about something we don't entirely understand? It reminds me of the prophet Jeremiah when he said, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Yet, you have shared with us a good example of worldview among the Papuans and their misconception when a missionary talks about Jesus as the Lamb of God. Others, more curative missionaries, used the pig as the symbol of Jesus, and it was a complete failure. You have well described, and with clear examples, the implications of how Westerners and Easterners integrate in their lives their religion, the visible and invisible concepts, the space and uh, quantitative and qualitative space, the scientific and traditional beliefs, supernatural, the natural world, time as linear and cyclical, what is right, what is wrong, shame, honor. Unfortunately, the amazing contribution by the first modern missionaries of, to the expansion of uh, God's kingdom brought also their own worldview, values, and allegiances, ignoring people's religious rituals and symbols. This led to syncretism and double allegiance. Since we are living in a postmodern world, future missionaries need to learn from others' mistakes. And as you said, research is needed in the area of intercultural hermeneutics in order to discover the meaning people assigned to religious symbols, rituals, stories, songs, and life in community. In your lecture, you have also shared one of your case studies, the very fascinating sto history of the Kanak in the New Caledonian and their animistic practices. This study case allows us to see how your academic achievements, research, innovation, engagement, and teaching activities are having a real impact on the world around us. It raises awareness of our condition as co-workers in Missio Day and how many challenges 
we have in the Mission Outreach Task Force of the Seventh-day Adventist Church around the world. Your lecture is profoundly theological and exalt biblical principles that searches for ways to reveal a relevant and meaningful gospel to every nation, tribe, people, and tongue. Building cultural bridges is the business of every missionary. Cultural bridges like La Coutume, La Parole, the Great Ancestor, and the Grand Hat are known forms which we can be can be used to point to Emmanuel, God with us among the Tanakh. Thank you for having exemplified how we can improve our missiological strategies. We can clearly understand the extreme importance of practicing metacognition, not ignoring the role of the Holy Spirit and scriptures to act as a filter in order to produce true conversion, which is beyond beliefs and traditions. After responding to your lecture, which offers enlightening explanations in your area of expertise, inspiration, and produce exchange of ideas, I declare proudly, as your colleague, that you are eminently worthy the title of Professor of Intercultural Studies, Missiology, and Research at IAS Seminary. So thank you. Thank you again. And finally, this lecture is thought-provoking, and I hope we will have many more other lectures of this kind in the future. Thank you. Well, we praise God for uh, our esteemed colleague, Dr. Dumitrescu, for the milestone, well-deserved milestone that he's reached. And uh, thank you for the fascinating lecture uh, with all the missiological deep implications and uh, we can all apply it in our uh, ministries. And uh, we really wish you God's blessings as you continue your ministry of teaching and research. And uh, we thank him for your contribution to the Applied Theology Department, to the seminary, and to the whole highest. Um, in conclusion, I'd like to invite you to stand for prayer. Lord, we praise your name for what you're doing for us and in us. And Lord, we thank you for Dr. Dimitrescu for his uh, great contribution to this institution and to the um, uh, field of missiology that goes uh, worldwide. And Lord, we pray that, um, uh, that you would continue to bless him as he continues to serve you in many capacities in research and teaching as he molds the, the minds and the thinking of students that... Uh, he would be able to lead them uh, in a deeper understanding how you want us to reach people, how the Holy Spirit wants uh, us to wor work alongside where he is leading us. And Lord, I pray that um, you would bless Dr. Dimitrescu personally, his family, and his future, and uh, uh, everything that uh, he does uh, for your glory. Lord, I pray that you would continue to bless our students, our faculty, uh, because we want to glorify you and we want to serve you where you are, have called us. And we uh, praise your name for those opportunities. In Jesus' name, amen. You are invited to enjoy some light refreshments just here by the kitchenette. Uh, we will have a defense, a doctoral defense, in about half an hour's time.